Thank you. So in three, two. Good afternoon, and I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for September 7th, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast from Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lusher? I'm present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Stolowski? Present. Okay, hey, thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Here. Ms. Shea? Here. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. M Ms. Myers? Here. Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Fisher? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Stansberry? Present. Ms. Bailey? Ms. Larson? Ms. Wicks? Present. Dr. Wolf? Present. Ms. Machinda? Ms. Holly Brilliant? And Ms. Forster. Present. That's it. Okay, thank you. We got a full house today. Yep. Um, please call and note the names of any other staff members participating in the meeting. Re request That's if there are other members participating on the call that you may not have named. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, good. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge that they have a question by calling on the chair, then stating their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. This will allow for accurate recognition of those that speak out. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? Assistance will, assistance will speak each committee Hi. member. Hello? For their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, got all of that out of the way. Um, so first, I'd like to thank staff for putting together the PowerPoints for us. Um, again, it's very helpful to give us some context before we are in the meeting. So the first item is the experimental, experimental, no, exper exp experiential. <laughs> experiential learning in financial and career readiness. Whoa, that's a mouthful. Um, so we're going to call on Ms. Shea and Ms. Fisher um, to give us a brief summary and then um, take any questions that board members may have. Thank you, Chair Lichter. Dr. DiDonato, did you want to start with anything or should I just jump right in? You are welcome to jump right in as I'm listening to the weather happening behind me and just... Yeah, the, the hail is quite loud at Jefferson. For <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, a good afternoon, uh, Chair Lichter and committee members. Um, thank you for allowing us this time today. As you saw in the presentation, uh, this is part of our ongoing efforts in support of Blueprint for Maryland's Future, specifically in Pillar 3, College and Career Readiness, um, which identifies several different initiatives to support college and career readiness, um, specifically with career counseling. And so um, Ms. Fisher is here as well, and we can certainly answer any additional questions, but this um, is in advance of a contract that will be coming forward to um, expand our partnership to be able to work with junior achievement 
um, and provide opportunities for our elementary and middle school students to have experiential learning um, in the areas of career and self-awareness and career exploration. So there's many um, other initiatives that fall within this pillar that our system is working on, but this particular contract that will be coming forward to contracts committee is going to allow us um, to provide these experiences for our elementary and middle school students as the beginning of this pathway towards career and self-awareness and career exploration and identification. And so you can go to the next slide. Um, Ms. Fisher, I don't know if you are certainly welcome to join in, but as I mentioned, um, students are going to have opportunities in fifth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, they're going to have an opportunity to attend BizTown as well as Finance Park. These are incredible opportunities. We'll certainly find a time for board members to come visit as well. Um, but this is an, a, a partnership that's really going to allow our students to have those experiential learning opportunities that are very hands-on, but that also engage them in opportunities for reflection and identifying aspirations, learning about di different career pathways, skills, that they would need um, opportunities to engage. You can see some of our students working as tellers at the bank in the photograph, um, but it also sets them down that pathway around identifying course pathways, whether that's applying for a specific CTE program or magnet program, um, or even just the skills they need to develop in the core curricula. Um, so uh, Ms. Fisher, I know you've been working really closely with the team in CTE and in social studies on our end that are partnering together as well as with Junior Achievement. Um, and this is also a part of our ongoing partnership with CCBC and the County Workforce Development Board. Um, so anything you want to add there? Um, just that these are very popular programs, particularly BizTown and Inspire with our schools and families. And this takes an opportunity where previously these have largely been accessed through um, up, you know, a school having the available funds, this allows it to become a system-wide program. And so that's really one of the biggest shifts with this is it um, takes it from, you know, an, you know, something that happens for some kids to something that becomes part of the BCPS student experience. And so that's what we're really excited about in terms of these pieces. The one piece that is relatively new is this Finance Park, which is around seventh grade. That is a brand new program um, that we've been working to kind of implement and it started, we piloted it some last year and we're really excited to really launch it for all of our seventh graders. And if I can add, because I know we often talk about, in addition to um, this partnership and the funding that comes from some of Blueprint um, to support the experience, it also includes training um, for our educators around there is a learning component that happens before, during, and after this experience so that we do some instruction before. Um, so there are curricular materials that are included as part of the contract, but they also help to align to some of the financial literacy curriculum we already have in, in BCPS, which is why it's also a partnership um, with our social studies department because um, some of these um, community skills as well as financial literacy skills cross over between our social studies curriculum, which all of our students participate in, as well as some of our CTE courses. Um, so as part of this partnership, not only do the students have the experience, but our teachers will have an opportunity to have uh, participate in training. Um, and then they will also provide us with curricular support. Um, and then last but not least, I will just point out that we do get a lot of feedback from stakeholders across the community, especially about those personal finance skills, the need for students to learn how to develop a budget, how to plan, how to save. Um, many of our students, by the time they're in high school, are already working their first jobs. They're already saving for that first car, or maybe even saving to support and contribute to their own expenses for school. So part of this vision is the earlier we teach students these skills and these really important uh, career readiness skills, as well as giving them an opportunity to have that experiential opportunity for different pathways can inform their future. So I'm sure you can tell we're excited about it. Uh, it will be coming um, forward as a contract and we welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you for that. Does um, any do any board members have any questions about this contract? OK, hearing none. Oops, I so somebody. Glad. I always have a question. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Ms. Booker Dwyer. OK, so um, so thanks for this presentation at, at Junior Achievement. They're a great group um, and the learning experiences that happen before and after. It's just wonderful. 
Um, so my question is around uh, the this career readiness experience, you know, connected to the blueprint. So we know now on the books, there is a code of Maryland regulation that requires students to have an academic or career plan prior to grade nine. And so how is this experience um, fitting in with, you know, the career plans that students are currently developing? Well, I guess I'll back up. So are are all Baltimore County students that are currently developing career plans? So if I go into a middle school or, um, or, or a grade five and I ask the school counselor, oh, let me see the career plans for these students, would that be available? Dr. Nino, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Sure, oh. I can. So um, our students currently engage our Office of um, School Counseling, who we can have a follow-up conversation um, with as far as maybe some next steps with information, um, does engage students with a six year planning process that does include looking at course pathways as well as looking at, you know, career pathways, CTE. Um, it may be discussion that, you know, based on a certain career or something a student wants to do. Certain courses may be recommended pre registration for courses for the next school year. Um, there is at this time not a current a consistent format that's done with each school um, the office of school counseling has provided a little more autonomy to the schools with regarding um, creating those doc documents forms and the survey questions that they use with students um, they are looking at it, as a matter of fact it was part of a discussion in a meeting earlier today with um, the our county partners ccbc and workforce development um, to talk about creating a more consistent format and structure for that um, so that is something that our Office of School Counseling is looking at. One other item I might add um, is that in the Inspire piece, the part that we have JA Inspire, it is actually written in there to interact with that, that six year plan. So that mm -hmm. is part of the pieces that we've, you know, working to develop and um, lean into some of the existing structures, but then enhance them. Right, I was going to offer the same thing. Some of that curricular material that comes with each of these experiences, the after the experience opportunity would be the direct connection that I think you're speaking. Um, we are not yet ready to connect those dots to that plan, but as Dr. Dean and I shared, that's the vision of what comes next. So if you walked in tomorrow, schools might say, well, but rest assured that that is what is the outcome is that then these experiences feed directly into um, that career plan because it's again an opportunity opportunity and, and career and college, right? Because students are identifying if this is my ultimate career plan, this might be a program of study or a course pathway. So we want to keep those really closely connected. Oh, that's Thank you. That, that's all I have for now. Toward. OK, she said for now. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I heard Thank that you. part. <laughs> Any, anybody um, other questions about this first contract? Yes, I said I just had one. Go ahead, Ms. Dominowski. Um, I, you already answered this. I just wanted to kind of make it more clear. This is going to be something that's um, written into all curriculums for these grades, you know, fifth grade. It's not going to be something that they have to seek out and find. It's it's going to be something that's going to be available to them. But like, yes, it, it's written so the, right in. Does that make yes, yes, ma'am. So it's going to be a part of the core curriculum, which is different. That's the expansion. It used to be some schools did it. The one challenge we have just with, I believe it's BizTown because of the number of elementary schools, um, we are working to scale up. Right now we have a plan for a rotation where every student will experience it in the curriculum. Some students, it may be virtual as opposed to the hands-on simply because of the number of days available and the number of students we're trying to serve in that experience. So we're working with JA. Um, our vision would try to have the same experience for all students, but um, every student it's built into the curriculum as an expectation, not something that families have to seek out separately or that they would have to fund separately. Um, but just in full transparency, we are large as a school system, and so we are currently navigating um, how to get enough trips in without starting on the first day of school to make sure that um, every student, so every student will experience it in fifth grade. Um, they just, some might experience it virtually and we're working on a rotation. Every student will experience the finance park and every eighth grader goes to JA Inspire. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Stileski, do you have a question? 
Um, yes, so thank you um, for your honesty regarding the demands on all of the fifth grade students. The biz town seems truly amazing. And I just wonder so that all students could have the hands on experience. Would it make sense to maybe expose some of them in sixth grade and sort of um, yes, balance yes. it out that way? Because yes. I just don't see how it could be the same. If it it's can't virtual. be nearly. We, we agree, Ms. Dolsky. And so yeah. when I said that where it is right now is um, we that's why we have a vision even about rotating schools, whether you experience it in fourth or fifth grade so that somewhere in your elementary experience, you, knowing that, of course, our populations are transient and it wouldn't be perfect. Same thing we've talked about um, with sixth grade. Would that be a more reasonable um, ask knowing again that our feeder patterns aren't always perfect. So we we get that the experience is not identical. We know we'll hear from some fifth graders if they don't get the same experience. So we're committed to, to figuring that out in lots of different creative ways. And JA has been a great partner um, with, with trying to help us, even if we can figure out how to partner schools that might be smaller, that we can double up. So we're, we're getting really creative. That's our goal. Um, I just wanted in full transparency in the first year, we're also trying to balance um, what is possible. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? My question was also about um, the rotation, so thank you for answering that. And also, Ms. Shea, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning the um, training for teachers. I feel like you may have anticipated my question about that. I'm advance. getting good at that. I know <laughs> what you, you're all going to ask me. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ms. Pumphrey. Anything else right now? OK, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract for experiential learning in financial and career readiness? So moves Don't to move Lusky. Down, <laughs> so I think I had a first and a second there. Um, yeah. May we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Tulowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that contract um, we did approve. The next yeah. one, you're welcome. The next one up is the reading intervention for secondary schools. And for that, will we call on Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft to provide the summary and answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato. Do you want to, I just always want to make space for you if you want to chime in, otherwise we'll just get rolling. I appreciate that, but let it, we can keep moving. I can keep chime in later. <laughs> OK, great. Um, so again, this is a contract that will be coming forward. Um, many of you who've been on the curriculum committee for some time have seen this graphic um, previously. And so this really represents our vision for uh, reading multi-tiered systems of support. So of course, our ultimate goal is to ensure that our secondary, that our elementary students, and we've made, you know, we, we've launched our new curriculum. We've been working on our foundational skills because our goal would be that we could send our students into the secondary grades um, prepared to participate in that tier one ELA core. We know that our current data indicates that we have far too many students who are not um, at that proficiency level. And so it is necessary for us to have a menu of curricular programs aligned to different areas of reading, um, both in foundational skills and structured literacy through vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. And so part of what we wanted to bring forward today, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kraft to, to offer some more details and then open it for questions, because I know you had an opportunity to listen and observe the, the fullness of the presentation. Um, but our vision is to be able to provide a menu or multi-tiered systems of supports for students. And one of the products that we've had um, great success with um, full implementation and, and usage is our HMH Read 180 program. So Dr. Kraft can, um, I know in the presentation, she highlighted a couple of places where we saw success, um, specifically pointing out that accelerated growth, students making more than a year's gain in a year's time, which is really the vision for any type of acceleration model of support. Um, but this will be coming forward as a, a contract as well for a spending authority increase, and that's to allow us to be able to provide those licenses for individual students. So Dr. Kraft, I'm going to invite you if you want to talk a little bit more specifically about it, but I just wanted to frame the context of uh, where we are and um, where we're going. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you. I always uh, love talking about literacy acceleration uh, so that all of our students can be college and career ready and uh, whatever their post-secondary pathway is. And so uh, READ 180, uh, like Ms. Shea said, is one of the options that we have for comprehension-based interventions. Um, and it is also a highly rated under ESSA um, intervention. There's very few for that secondary comprehension and READ 180 is one of them. Uh, we uh, have tremendous growth um, with READ 180. And I just wanna highlight that um, in the 1920 school year, we had in terms of secondary schools, about 13 schools actively offering reading intervention. Um, and at this year, we're at 45 schools that are offering an evidence-based intervention for our students. And so um, in addition to having this program, I just wanna highlight the work that our secondary schools have done to make sure that our students have what they need. And so uh, we are uh, willing to, I could talk about this all day, but I wanna make space for questions. I know that we, you listened to the presentation. So uh, let us know what questions you have and I'd be happy to answer them. I just had a quick comment, if that's okay. Go ahead. Ms. No, Demansky. I'm really, I, I'm having um, had a child go through the Orton-Gillingham, you know, intervention and seeing how much it improved um, his direction and reading and really I'm excited about this and I'm, I'm glad I, I'm hoping it will be in all schools and that everyone who needs this will get it because it yeah. really turned, it turned our lives around. So I appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. I just have a question or a comment. Just could you give us a little bit of explanation on the slide that you have up right now talking about the percentages and those yeah. percentages don't align with the percentages that we get on some of our test scores. Right. So, so you yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. So, oh, I'm sorry, Michelle, did you want to start? You know, when I start talking about MTSS, I'm like, let me tell you. Um, and so I'm a really big believer in just not throwing around the word MTSS, but I really do believe that when we have a multi-tiered system of support that all students can achieve at high levels. And so what this um, triangle is, is actually the national averages that say that 80 to 90 percent of your students should be able to be served through tier one instruction with differentiation and scaffolds approximately five to 15% of your students will need a tier two. So you're doing all the things in tier one, you're doing it with fidelity, you're using high quality instructional materials, you're differentiating, and they still need a little more. And then there really should be five to 10%, and some say three to five, um, but we landed around 5% when we, we looked at the different national models that should need that intense tier three support. Um, and what, what uh, Mache and I can tell you is that that isn't our current reality. And so when we think about what our current state is versus our ideal states, the slide that you see in front of you would be our ideal state. That's what we're working towards. And so right now we have to just take inventory and say, well, where are we at? and how are we going to make our numbers mirror what the national numbers are telling us it should look like in a multi-tiered system of support. And so part of the importance of intervention is to accelerate instruction and get them out of intervention as quickly as possible. And so, you know, one of the things that I say quite frequently in trainings and in coaching is that uh, intervention should not be a life sentence. It should be designed to give you what you need in the moment and get you back to core instruction. And so part of our work has been to, we've, we actually did a two-year task force to really say, what do we need to make sure that we know how to place students, how to uh, observe students and teachers, and how to exit students when they have met that criteria for being on grade level and, and on track for college and career readiness. And so we have done a lot of work. And, you know, and this is not an excuse, but I'd like to just mention that there was a pandemic in the middle of that. And so our numbers aren't where they I'd like them to be. And what I will tell you is that we have 36 secondary schools offering READ 180 this year. We actually trained 32 um, teachers that had never taught READ 180 before in um, August, and we have another 11 signed up for our October training. And so what I'm saying is that schools are really seeing the importance of this and making sure that they have made a pathway for students to be successful. Thanks. So ideally, when we have effective tier one taking place, um, then we have 80 or 90 percent of our students should be successful. So that this chart is the ideal. 
our this is our ideal now. state. Right. Our this is not our right current now. state, but okay. I, I believe we can get here. Right. I truly, right. truly believe we can get here. And, and, and I know in a little bit we will be talking about our update on into reading. Right. Now that we have a high quality instructional material that has numerous reports on the efficacy of um, implementation and student results, we will really be able to do a lot of stuff at core that maybe we were having to intervene before because there might have been some holes in some places. And so what we can say is we now have an aligned curriculum that spirals, that is to the rigor of the standard. And so some of this will be that we are going to be able to offer less intervention classes because they're going to get what they need in core. Thanks for that clarification. Ms. Pumphrey, do you have a question? I just uh, more of clarification. So this intervention is only for secondary students, not for our lower primary grades, correct? That's correct. Correct. So and, th this one was just around the Read 180 contract, okay. but um, I do have, I, I, I certainly have other documents that talk about what we do at elementary. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer, question? Yes, I have a few questions. Yeah. How many of our students or what percentage of Baltimore County secondary students are currently reading below grade level? So my Do you follow want to start, Michelle? <laughs> well, I was just going to say my follow up question would be based on what metric, yeah. right? And so when we look at our MCAP data, I can tell you that it would be the inverse, of course, of the students mm -hmm. scoring um, at proficient. When we talk about using the phrase reading below grade level, that typically would involve an additional screener. So Dr. Kraft can talk about the percentage of students that have been identified through a reading screener. Um, and, and I don't know if she has that on hand or if we need to follow up, but we do have those numbers of what percentage of students have been um, diagnostically um, screened. The reason I'm making the distinction is because we're talking about the percentage of students. When you have too many students needing tier two and tier three, as we mentioned before, our pyramid is upside down. It's a tier one problem, right? And so I don't, which is why we've been making such concerted efforts about ensuring we have an evidence-based curriculum and professional learning. So I would hate to, to label those students as being reading below grade level when really their proficiency is not measuring at grade level, but it would be two different numbers. I, I hope that makes sense of what I'm trying to say. No, it makes, to it makes total sense. And, um, and, and I'm really looking at not so much the MCAP scores, but those that have been that, absolutely that, diagnostic. Yep. That, you know that you are reading below grade level mm -hmm. because I, I I really do feel like we're in a state of emergency, right? I agree. And I, I get we just got this new curriculum and it's going to take years before we see those the, the outcomes of that work. And so I'm wondering what can we do now? Like I know, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Dominowski, she talked about how great the, the Ortho Gilliam uh, Plus program is, and it is, it's wonderful. And I get it, it's tier three, less than 5% of your students need to be there. But at what point in Baltimore County do we say, this is a state of emergency for our students. We have a significant number of students who have been diagnosed as being, as reading below grade level. And I'm sure if we test some others, it's gonna appear that they're reading below grade level. And so we can't just teach the curriculum. I mean, the right. curriculum is great, but so what is the strategy there to to catch these students up because they don't have another year and I, I get with the multi tiered support. You got to go, you know, this way. But at what point did we say, OK, we're throwing this triangle to the side for a little bit and we know that this program works. And so we're going to invest our money in that for these students that have been diagnosed as, you know, reading significantly below grade level. And we'll come back to the triangle when we're more in a stable state. But right now, we're not in a stable state to implement this multi-tiered system of support as intended. So, uh, Dr. Junior, you want to go first, or you want me to answer? So, Ms. Booker, I, we couldn't agree more. We know we are absolutely in a crisis state with our student achievement, and we know that we need to do some significant things differently immediately. So, part of the work with meeting with secondary administrators, working with our colleagues, the executive directors in the Department of Schools, has been a very clear message around the need to screen students who they have concerns about, and students who qualify must be placed in a reading intervention. We continue to work with them, hence why um, Dr. Kraft explained that we have more 
teachers being trained next month. So identifying and knowing that we do have more students who need this intervention. Part of working with our secondary EDs has also been to discuss, you know, what are the scheduling implications? What do we need to do with the administrators as well as our master schedule is to ensure that we have this provided for our students who need it. Um, so we are 100% in agreement that we have to act swiftly, that we cannot waste time. Um, to truly assessing diagnosing students and then getting them um, into the support that they need it is of the utmost priority for us. And one of the things that we did um, recently was in our secondary English curriculum is we made sure that all of our um, curriculum had diagnostic assessments at the beginning of units and that was designed so that we could find out what um, skills a students might be missing that would allow them to successfully interact with that unit. And then we provided a column that said, here's some just-in-time support so that we're not removing the instruction, but we're saying if you do the instruction plus this, that they will be able to successfully engage in grade level material. And I think that's one step, right, in saying that we understand that there might be some gaps and that there might be something, well, there are, not there might be, there are some gaps. And what are the gaps and what do our students need need to still engage in grade level rigorous content material. And so that is one thing that that my team has done. I'm extremely proud of the work that they've done, the supports that they have provided. We've provided professional development around that. And so that is one thing that when you said, what can we do for everybody? I think that first it's just like knowing what do kids need in this moment to be successful and then let's give it to them. I was just going to, oh, go ahead. Now, Ms. Booker Dwyer, I know you have more questions, but but that's why I asked my original question, because when you look at, I think this slide is a, can be deceiving if we don't understand it. So even though the slide says those percentages, we may have 40% of our kids getting a tier two intervention because that's what's needed. So correct. OK, so we are not right. We're not only providing our, our neediest 5% for tier three right now. Oh, Whoever, no, right. no, right. Okay. Um, and I will get you exact numbers um, because I would also want to break it down into um, decoding and comprehension and then just kind of right. give you the, yeah, you know, so I can I can do a follow up on that. Right, so that state of emergency that, that Ms. Booker Dwyer talked about, we're, we're responding to that by putting way more kids in interventions right now than this ideal state once we have a highly effective teaching of a, a core tier one program. Hence the need the for reason. the contract. <laughs> Spending authority. Thank you, Michelle. We're coming your way, and and I was gonna just offer to your point um, when you said, you know, at what point does VCPS move the track? We're here. We've been right. here, and and some of what I also want to offer, we've made changes just from an infrastructure pers perspective. We have two positions in the office of ELA, even though the office overall has gotten um, significantly smaller, we have prioritized intervention support um, with two dedicated positions specifically focusing on secondary, and that has enabled us to provide much more school-based support on the transition from fifth to sixth grade, which historically has been a challenge. How do we make sure that we don't lose students who have had that support in elementary school who may still need it in sixth grade um, and then doing the same at that transition from eighth to ninth. What I also want to offer is that's why um, you'll see reflected on this chart besides programs we also reference professional learning. Secondary teachers by nature are not trained to teach children how to read. They are and so there is a gap that we are currently as um, Dr. Crofts um, mentioned but part of our um, state of urgency and response is shifting the types of professional learning that we're requiring of secondary educators because we need to, um, so our students that are in our secondary grades won't have the benefit of the open court evidence-based curriculum that we put in place in the elementary school. They didn't have the benefit, they won't have the benefit of this new evidence-based elementary curriculum. So it has to be a both and. We have to continue to strengthen that tier one while also hopefully temporarily really increasing and shifting our supports both through that human capital and this increased spending authority to make sure that as Dr. DiNonato said, every student needs it, whether they have an identified learning disability or they're a casualty of not having that evidence-based curriculum. Either way, our responsibility is to fill in those gaps and to make accelerated progress so that they can uh, meet those uh, expectations. 
Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer, did you have another question? Not until slide six. OK, I think you, you can ask it. I think they were just having this one up for display. So go to slide six and ask your next question. So uh, maybe seven, the one with the yes. Seven. This, so here, I, I had a hard time with this slide. Um, so we're saying at Catonsville High School, this 650, this is the Lexile score, right? That's correct. So yes. This 650 is what, like a grade three reading level? Give or take. So what grade level are these students Kate, this is the high school collectively, or this is ninth graders, tenth graders. Oh, no. the, these are students that have been in our intervention. Um, these are this is just um, students that enrolled in Read 180 to give you a sense of the growth over time. And historically, what we see is that um, a student that needs intervention that does not receive intervention or receives ineffective instruction um, sometimes makes negative gain or typically around a 0.3 gain in a year. And what what we're showing in that re that slide that you were just referring to is that with um, an intervention that is delivered with fidelity, we're, we are actually accelerating growth for students that have historically not even made one um, grade level growth in a year, which hence why they are three and four and five years below grade level. So this population, that chart you're seeing is just the students that are enrolled in Read 180 and their growth throughout the year. So I do like that there's growth. That's always a good thing. But when I'm looking at these scores and I'm seeing like elementary school Lexile levels for high school and middle school students, is I'm wondering if Read 180 is the right intervention. So this is where my concern com um, comes in, where if you have a high school student reading at a grade three, why are they not in tier in a higher tier of support? So like, what is that cutoff score to say all right, you're reading at an elementary school level. You need great. You need that tier three level of support and you need summer school and you need some after school. So like what do we have the right students in this level of support? Because them in high school at grade three only accelerating one grade level, one year's growth will not be enough to get them reading. I mean, at, we need at least we need to get them reading at a much higher level. So this is where this just, I love seeing the growth, but it concerned me that we have high schools reading at elementary school levels and not just elementary school levels, low elementary school levels. So Ms. Booker Dry, I think you highlighted a couple of pieces here. One is students getting to high school and reading at a third grade level is, you know, a foundational pro that that's a problem in and of itself that we are, working very diligently to address, hence the you know concerted effort when we say secondary schools, that is middle and high schools, because if we don't have them reading on grade level when they leave elementary, we certainly need to try to stop it before they get to high school. So with the implementation of Read 180, um, students who aren't showing progress is when we really look to try a different intervention with them. But when we see students making 1.6 years, so that's more than it's a year and a half in a in a school year, um, decrease is even better. It's closer to almost two years growth in, in a single school year. Those students are benefiting from the program. And so again, Catonsville High School, part of our, our issue and situation is that starting in high school, right? The goal, if we look at Deep Creek, you know, middle school, if we can close that gap there, then we're not going to have that situation in high school. So the students are responding to it. Um, and so I, I, I'll defer to Dr. Kraft. My background in special education and, and rule of thumb, we are seeing, and they're not even just making progress, they're making more than a year's progress in a single school year. Um, so I, that, that would be the trajectory that we want to see happen. Um, we do offer summer school. These students might be recommended, maybe recommended. However, summer school is optional. Parents can select to send their students or not. Um, students may participate or not. Um, so there's, you know, things that we can do. We've offered, you know, with a lot of the ESSER funds had tutoring programs. But again, while students can be recommended to participate in them, students may select or parents may select for them not to participate in them. Um, so being able to see this kind of results during a school day instruction where we have them, 
they're going to be with us during that time um, is truly going to help us make that progress. Dr. Kraft, did you want to add? But that, wait a second, this is a tier two. This is identified as a tier two intervention, correct? Correct. So, correct. so why would those students, if they're third grade in high school, why would they not have been given a tier three intervention instead of a tier two? Can I start and then I'll, uh, yeah. Dr. Kraft? Of course. Yes. Yeah, so um, because the, the nature of the tiered interventions isn't just about the grade level, it's about why the student is currently reading at that grade level and their response to the programming. So typically when we think about a tier three intervention, it oftentimes is a full replacement. Um, it typically is used, it has to be taught by a specifically certified or trained individual, oftentimes the special educator. It's sometimes taught in a pulled out or self-contained setting. And I'm saying typically because, of course, students are not a monolith. And so we don't say, we do typically say two or more as a basic window, but a student who's reading at this grade level might actually be a reflection of a lack of evidence based instruction and responses to that student. There might not be any specific developmental reason for the student other than they haven't had the evidence based high quality instruction uh, delivered in a consistent format and the opportunity for that. So that's when we look at. Um, whether or not the student is actually making accelerated growth before we move to a tier three. We always want to try to have that least restrictive approach first to see that response. The other piece that I want to add here is there is a unique aspect of adolescent learners. When we're talking about students, as you all can imagine, in the middle and high school who are not successful readers, that comes with a whole host of other social and emotional, very critical skills that matter. Read 180 is unique and really well renowned in that it honors the fact that they are still 13, 14, 15, and 16 years old. They don't want to read about an eight-year-old's birthday party. You can't just put them in any text because it's written at that Lexile level. It is very specific that it intersects Lexile level with developmental level. They're still teenagers. They still have that same social piece, and the research is clear that that's critical for adolescent learners in particular. And so when we're thinking about different tiered intervention programs, we're trying to make the best fit for the student. And so while the number of years below grade level is a factor, so certainly we think about two or more being a piece of it, it's not automatic that we just group kids based on the current um, reading level. Um, I think, you know, as we look at the data, we also work with schools because we also need to make sure that the data is reflecting um, high usage, consistent implementation. We make some changes to to things like frequency or duration of the intervention. What does the group size look like? How much individual attention? So there's many other factors in terms of implementation that can continue to accelerate the progress students make or can in some cases um, be an inhibiting factor. So um, all of those are components that are considered when um, choosing the right intervention. But I, I did want to just add that piece about um, the, the adolescent literacy needs and, and that other piece that's so important. And I'm just going to add a little bit everything that Dr. D. Donato and Ms. Shea said, and um, this is one measure. And so we are very, when we look at a student and, and do a placement into reading intervention, we try to triangulate data and have a minimum of three data points that we look at. And so not every student um, tests in a way that it shows up. Um, in terms of of what they can do in that moment, and I'm not, and I'm just saying like you, there's a lot of factors there, um, and so we are seeing that growth. And then also high school, uh, you know, when you start thinking about uh, courses for credit and graduation, you always have to balance out because Ms. Shea just referred to typically when you go into tier three, you go out of core, and so in a true MTSS model, they might not take English because we're saying they need a double period of reading. Um, and so the, the all of those then impact graduation and college and career readiness. And so um, I would say that we are starting to see some really um, good progress. I actually, um, before I moved to the district office, I taught Read 180 at the high school level and saw tremendous, in a different district, but saw tremendous growth of my students. Um, I had students that came back to me after graduation and, and was like, you know what, I went to college, you know, I, I learned to read. And so um, I agree that there are some big gaps. If we start to see the students not making progress, that's when we start to look at a tier three. Ms. Booker-Dwyer, do you have a follow-up to that question you started? 
I'm just, I'm not comfortable with, if Read 180 is the intervention for these high school and middle school students reading at elementary school level, I'm not comfortable with that intervention for them. Um, I'm not comfortable with approving the contract if that is what this is being used for. I don't think it meets the intent of what Read 180 was designed to do. Um, I, I appreciate the growth. The bigger issue and that I can't, I can't, it doesn't sit well with me is that we're graduating students who are reading at an elementary school level. And if we're not, I would rather see that money go somewhere where we're investing in some intensive supports because we know that just to be functional in, in our society, to get a decent job, you at least need to read at a grade seven. And we're graduating students from Chesapeake High School in Catonsville from what's on this thing that are not there. So we're doing a disservice to students. So I'm not comfortable with the Read 180 contract if it's being used in this way. I can see if a student is like two grade levels behind or something like that. But when we're talking about like this significant gap, something more needs to be done here. So, um, so that's that's my whole um, piece. Cause like, in, you know, just the other questions I have, like, when these types of data is being presented, just having the end, like, how many students does this represent um, for this growth, and you know, what are the demographics of these students? Like, I had a whole bunch of data questions, but what just kind of stopped me in my tracks was just seeing these Lexile scores at high school and middle school level, knowing that, you know, these could be 12th graders that were about to hand a diploma, saying that you're college and career ready but yet you're reading at fourth and third grade levels. May I offer a follow-up question, Ms. Booker? Because I, you know, I hear the passion and I share it, and I, I really do appreciate that. So two things that I want to offer, and, and I know Dr. Kraft said this earlier. I do want to be cautious about saying this Lexile level means they're reading at a third grade level. The, the Lexile is one measure. We tried to give you two data points from within the Read 180 program of a before and after assessment to show growth. I, I don't know that I'd be prepared to say if a student got a 650 Lexile on the Read 180 measure, that automatically means they're reading at a third grade level. I, I don't know that. I, I think it's one measure that reflects within the internal, but I hear what you're saying. The second piece that I just want to offer, just from a practical standpoint, if we don't approve the contract, no one can be in Read 180, even the students that you might agree would be more appropriately served. So I hear what you're saying about the need to be more judicious in who gets what, having more specific data points around Tier 3. And I think we can, with Dr. DiDonato's leadership, come back with more about our acceleration plan altogether, because this is a tiny fraction of all the different things that we do, and that might help alleviate some of your concern. But I just want to offer while I hear, and obviously your vote is your vote and you, you need to do what you speak. If you agree that anyone would benefit from Read 180, we have to have a, a contractor. We can't. So I hear your feedback loud and clear. I think there are things that we can do to share other resources that we have in place that might help. And no doubt we are all here because we know we can and must do better for these students and it's not OK. So um, but I just want to offer those two pieces. I think if if again, with Dr. DiDonato and Chair Ledger's permission, we could have a whole meeting just on acceleration at the secondary level, the, the, all the pieces that we do, all the ways that this supports that and address a lot more of your questions, um, because I do hear it and, and I do share it and it, it's not um, it's not anything we take lightly. Um, I believe in the quality of the program. It's one of the very few that is higher, highest rated under ESSA. And so I don't want to overcorrect um, from a contract perspective and then not be able to serve the students for whom it may be exactly the right fit. So I just want to offer that um, as a as a follow up to what you shared. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can you switch the slide back to the triangle one? I know I said I didn't like the triangle, but I just want to see again. Um, OK, what the tier three. Right now, we're using Wilson and Orton Gillingham for tier three, correct? But that's, that's correct. Group, for and those are one. And visualizing, sorry. Go ahead. And visualizing and verbalizing if it's a comprehension. Okay. Are those all one? Are those all one? I know that Orton Gillingham is one on one, correct? 
Um, they have group sizes that are very small, sometimes two to one, sometimes three to one. I think uh, Wilson reading identifies three to one as the ideal ratio, but Dr. Kraft can, it may be up to four. But yes, it's a much smaller ratio, which adds to the complicating factor of some of the decision making, for sure. Okay, all right. Thank you. Ms. Stoleski, you have a question about um, this contract? Yes, thank you. Um, and I do agree with, you know, a lot of the things that have been shared. Um, I just wonder, um, because the the student buy-in with the reading material is so important, especially middle school and high school where they have to enjoy what they're reading, has there been any initiative to put little libraries in classrooms in middle school and high school, similar to what they do in elementary school? I know the exchangery has books um, to just move along with getting more kids to love reading and then enjoying reading in their independent time, which would then support their growth. Absolutely, and uh, Dr. Kraft, I also invite you. So I love that we're talking about flooding rooms with books because you're right. Um, it's such a critical part of developing literacy for students. Um, we do have um, specific resources, including classroom libraries. These programs have leveled opportunities for students. And what I mean by that is, again, that intersection of what's something if I'm 15 and I'm not reading on grade level that I'd be interested in reading, to your point, to hook my level of reading, but that I can read. Uh, that's a very specific type of text. We're not going to hand 16 year olds decodable texts to read with their friends. That's not going to happen. Um, we also partner, remember, especially with tier two, our students are in our ELA core as well as in our tier two, both HMH Read 180. And also, I know we're not talking about ILET today. Um, very strategically choose the texts for the program that are high interest. Um, with a more accessible readability. Um, and then they come with independent options for kids to continue that reading. Many of our intervention teachers also do book clubs with our students, which is another way to promote the social aspects of reading. You know, it's why Oprah and I think Jenna Hager Bush has one now, like at Reese Witherspoon, everyone has a book club, but that is a, a really proven way to help kids get hooked on reading. And so some of our uh, secondary intervention teachers do have book clubs that they offer. Um, and then they partner with the ELA teachers looking at some of those high interest culturally responsive novels that we've been building out so that students are getting support with um, as they're growing in their reading intervention class, they can apply that to some of their choice reading in their ELA classes. Um, Dr. Kraft, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to that, but uh, we definitely agree the more more books, more text, more options to read. Also, our kids like to read different type of media. They're very interested in some of the digital magazines and some of the um, different periodicals. There's a lot more um, with um, short apps, even um, different bloggers, influencers, different types of reading, which can help get kids into that idea of uh, seeing reading as a part of their social and um, school growth. So um, Dr. Kraft, anything you want to add to that? Um, you said it so beautifully. I did want to just plug that over the last um, three years, we've approved 10 new novels that really reflect um, culturally relevant texts with a, you know, intersectionality of identities, because we know the more relevant that uh, the novels and the text are to students, the uh, more engaged they're going to be and the more they're going to want to read. And so that, you know, I think that we always have to look at this as a multi-pronged approach. And so Read 180 is like one sliver of what we do. And a lot of times I'd like to say that really, I at one point did the math. It, when you look at an intervention period, whether you're in middle or high school, it's 16% of, of their time in a week, um, which means that that other 84% of the time is where they are getting literacy instruction. And so part of our approach has also been um, that we have a position dedicated to disciplinary literacy because we know that everybody has to own literacy. And so the more experiences they have, this isn't an English thing or a reading thing. This is an everybody thing. They read everywhere. And so we've also uh, really wanted to make sure that students have multiple varied literacy experiences in that other 84% of their day to really help them uh, increase their literacy achievement. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Ms. Pumphrey, do you want to make your comment now? I actually have a question and a comment now at this point. Um, it, 
back to um, Ms. Booker Dwyer's concerns. Um, is it possible for you to provide us with additional the additional information that you mentioned prior to this going to the full board for a vote? Because I have some similar concerns and I, I don't want to not approve this knowing that some students need it, but I would feel more comfortable knowing that we have additional information before a final vote is made. And just to clarify, are you talking about the number of students we have enrolled or um, I did while we were uh, you know, answering some of the questions, I did pull up all of the students at Catonsville um, are in ninth grade so that that data came from the ninth graders. Um, but yes, I would be happy to pull any data that you want. Um, I was able to you know, pull that up relatively quickly. So if there's specific pieces of data, so and I actually looked and it's it's it was one uh, 79 uh, Lexile growth. And so if they were able to do that in ninth grade, then when they grow another 200 Lexile in 10th grade, right? And so we're getting closer and I do hear what you're saying and, and we want all of our students to graduate college and career ready and ready for whatever post-secondary option they want. And um, in that particular case, I, I was able to pull that data right quick and just tell you they were all ninth graders last year. That is very helpful, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and my comment is was more about um, back to and that's why I said it's slightly off topic in the future. I'd like to see or you know soon I'd like to see some additional information regarding interventions for our primary grades, especially since we are implementing new curriculum um, and because we all know how how important you know the data shows how important it is for students to read by grade three. Um, so to get in there immediately before you know they get to the high school level and we're implementing some more of these interventions. You are speaking my language, Ms. Pumphrey, and you invite me back anytime you like, and I would talk to you all day about what we're doing in the primary or the intermediate or the secondary um, intervention. So, I, you know, please, I would be more than happy to come back and talk about what we're doing in the primary grades, and we have some exciting things going on uh, in our primary grades also. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Dinanato and I will put that on, on the agenda list. Um, for an upcoming meeting. So I'm looking at um, the question that was just put into the chat. So this contract is supposed to go to building and contracts on Monday to be approved by full board on Tuesday. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and if we do not approve it today, what implications does that have? We cannot purchase the number of licenses that would be needed for the students that uh, would be identified for READ 180. Because so we're seeing an increase, because of our sense of urgency to try to respond, we um, are outpacing what we had originally predicted when we calculated the spending authority. And, and I think that's really significant to say that these are students that we have already identified as needing that we don't have a license for. And, that, and that's good news in the sense of we have push so hard to say if students need it we need you to give it to them and then they're like okay yeah we'll do that but they didn't tell us in the spring but it's still good it's good that students are going to get interventions and so um when Ms. Shea says we wouldn't we would be outpacing it we've already outpaced it and so we're at a point where we would have to then um, intervene in a different way that wouldn't include read 180 if we don't approve it okay thank you for that um, any, I know we've spent a long time, but this is an important um, contract. Oh, Ms. Dominowski. I just have one quick question. Um, for the READ 180, how many teachers are actually certified for the, um, in secondary for the, for the, um, the READ 180? Yes, thank you. Read, <laughs> not just trained, but certified. So uh, what do you mean by so read 180 is not like Wilson in that it has a separate certification. Some of the intervention programs do. Sorry, have I, meant, I meant Wilson. I'm sorry. I meant, oh, I, meant, okay. I meant the Wilson reading system. I said that wrong. Sorry. That's okay. We can get you follow up information for Wilson, the number of teachers certified for Wilson reading because we do that in partnership with special education, but we can follow up and send that through Dr. DiDonato to share with all of you. Okay, thank you. But READ 180 in particular does not have its own separate certification. It just requires training and, of course, teacher certification. OK. Ms. Booker Dwyer. What would be the other intervention if READ 180 contract is not approved? Or how would the students identify? Well, so, OK, so this is what I'm getting at. I think that some of the students that are currently identified for READ 180 
could benefit from a more intensive level of support. And so if those students who are significantly behind grade level, would it be possible that if you have the current number of seats, then the money that would be allocated to ex extend or you know add more seats to this contract, could that then be used for more intensive intervention? Um, you know, is there an openness to look at the criteria that's being used for a student to be identified for READ 180? Because if we approve the contract as it is, then it's just saying we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're just going to put those students into to these seats who may really could benefit and see um, additional gains from a more intensive um, service. Ms. Shea, do you want me to start? Could you? I had to relocate just for one second and then I'll Yeah, try. of course. Um, so you're asking so many good questions and like I have so many things I want to say and I'm trying to be mindful of the time. So while we have classified, I, I guess I want to back up from it. While we have classified READ 180 as a tier two, it is actually um can be used as a tier two or tier three. When we talk about tiers, it's 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 complicated because a tier can have to do with size of group. It can have to do with time of allocation, like a 45 minute a day versus a 90 minute a day. Um, it, it could have to do with um, what additional um, supports and resources there are. So um, we do not use it as a tier three because when we decide a student needs a tier three, we move to a different program. Um, and so there's there's a lot of factors when you talk about like reallocating. And so um, I want to answer your first question, which was and maybe it wasn't your first, but one of your questions, which was yes, we would always be open to looking at our our, our um, classification system and how we um, look at students. And we use a very multifaceted approach, and we look at um, eight to ten pieces of um, data, which is not all uh, quantitative. There's qualitative data. There's a lot of pieces. There's parent input. There's student input. There's teacher input. There's counselor input. Um, and there's a lot of things that are looked that are looked at before we make a decision. Um, at this point, there are schools that have they they don't offer both. For example, so you said, well, what would happen? M and maybe some of them could go to a more intensive intervention if a team it, because we use a team approach, right? So if a team said yes, we think they they need a more intense approach, it, but schools either opt into read 180 or ILIT. Um, and so the schools that are currently using read 180, that's what their teachers have been trained in. Um, and then we have another subset of schools that opted into ILIT and that's what their teachers have been trained in. Um, and and you asked some very interesting questions that are very deep, right? Like I, I can't answer them in, in like the next three minutes, um, but I wanna assure you that we absolutely would look at criteria and say, you know, what, what do students need um, to be successful and also make sure that they are still on a pathway for graduation, especially at our high school level. And so I, it's a both and, and, and I don't think there's any easy answers, um, but ones that we really, we take a lot of time, which is why originally we thought we were going to do the literacy task force for one year. And I went to Ms. Shea at the end of the first year. I was like, so we got a good start, but I'm not ready to publish the document. And we spent a second year where we brought together executive directors, principals, assistant principals, teachers, parents, um, you know, we different content areas where we really did start to grapple with some of these issues. And we are on a journey. We are not where we need to be. And every um, day we strive to do better um, than we did the day before because we want to make sure students have what they need. We also want to make sure that teachers are prepared to teach the students because what happens at the secondary level is a lot of our teachers haven't gone through a, a program where they have learned to teach reading. So we are filling in the gaps for them. And one of our big celebrations is we have um, trained not all, during NEO and during professional study day, we actually for our secondary intervention teachers did training around the science of reading. And so we are filling in some of those gaps. And so I don't have an easy answer. I am going to let Ms. Shea fill in any more, to, but to say that, you know, I think that there are, you've brought some interesting points up and that we would have, but it would be 
school is having to figure out, OK, well, I scheduled three read 180 sections, but now what am I going to do? And I have a teacher that's going to give a different intervention that they're not trained in. And so logistically, there's a lot of pieces. And so I'm not saying no, I'm just saying it's a lot to unpeel and figure out. Well, and, and I was just going to summarize by saying just in full transparency, there'd be students scheduled in classes for a teacher that wouldn't have a license and wouldn't be able to access the curriculum. And so uh, I want to underscore that we're taking very seriously all of the feedback and certainly there's a lot more to share. But if you asked me what would happen the Wednesday after the contract committee, if this weren't passed, I just want to be really transparent. It wouldn't be that easy for high schools to pivot and to be able to reschedule students. It certainly is something that we will commit to engaging in because what would naturally happen is we would go meet with each school. We would look at the students currently identified. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you my action plan. We will go and meet with each of these schools because we already do. We will look at the students they currently have for Read 180. We will compare them to the data points and identify are their students better suited to be in Tier 3 and then begin to work individually with schools to make that happen. Um, that wouldn't happen the Wednesday morning after the contract and there would be students sitting in that class scheduled who would not be able to access the curriculum. So I just want to tell you both and in the spirit of full transparency and as partners, as board members, you know, in, in helping us to do the work. OK, thank you. That's all my questions. OK, I think we we um, will move on. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing I, I will be voting yes on this contract, though I agree with um, the concerns that have been brought up about whether we have the the right, whether our tier three are true students who need a tier three intervention, are they appropriately placed in getting what they need? I also have a concern for our students who truly need just a tier two intervention. And I do believe in 180's ability to help our students who truly need the tier, the tier two. So for that reason, I will be voting yes, but I think this idea of the tier three interventions is something that as a committee, we obviously want to hear more about um, and also updates on progress monitoring for READ 180 for the students that are put in it. The data charts were pretty discrepant from one school having 1.7 months of gains for whomever was ever in there, but another school, middle school, having only one. Um, one year's growth. So again, looking at the progress monitoring. So at this point, I am going to ask if someone will make a motion to approve the contract for READ 180 um, at this time. So move, Dominowski. Is there a second? Second, Stolowski. Okay, um, Miss, thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please, Miss Cox? Miss Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Golowski? Yes. Thank you. And I just want so it did get passed. I just want to acknowledge that I think that was a long conversation, but a, a needed one. Absolutely. I can see that I can see the look in Ms. Booker Dwyer's face. And I'm I and I I never have given a reason for my vote before, but I, I do think there's two different issues at play. Um, and I think it's also a good point about what data is brought to us um, to make sure that the data says enough, because if not, it leads to more questions. So we will leave it there. So it did get passed. Um, so the Office of Language Arts, you can take a breath at this point. Um, <laughs> And we appreciate it and 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 we hear it in the in the yes. pause and the and the tone and we we are right there with you and so while we appreciate the vote yes so we can move forward it in no way precludes us from all the work we've outlined tonight that has to happen so um, i hope that we have earned the trust to know that we take it seriously and we will absolutely respond um, while also breathing that we can move forward with um hopefully in support of our, our students and teachers so we appreciate the dialogue and the um sense of urgency because it actually Actually makes us feel supported in the work that we know we need to do for kids. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kraft. That was wonderful. She's sitting in a cubicle in the hailstorm and she uh, nailed it. So I appreciate you. OK, we are going to move on to a different topic for a second. So ELA can take a breather while we move to the community school system wide evaluation. 
And for that, we're going to ask for Ms. Wistead, for Dr. Wistead and Ms. Stansberry um, to present. And Ms. Foster. And Ms. Foster, I'm sorry. As well. Um, so I am just going to do a general, uh, just a few sentences, because really Michelle and Melissa have the details, but you will be seeing a contract coming through because a requirement of the concentration of poverty funds is to um, have an evaluation, an outside evaluator evaluate the community schools initiative. And so, um, you know, the slideshow that you saw gave you some information about the the group that was selected to do that evaluation. So with that, Ms. Stansbury, do you have uh, other summaries or do we want to just go to questions based on the time? I am ready for questions. OK, <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm ready. OK, all right. Are there any questions for concerning the community school initiative evaluation? Oh, I think we ran I out of questions. Can I, I ask one? Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Somebody go. I can't recognize a voice. Who who has a question? Miss Pumphrey, I think, has a question. Okay, go ahead, Miss Pumphrey. Yes, but mine's. Um, I was going to let you go first because mine's not necessarily related to the contract. It just in general. I know there was an issue regarding um, um, the concentration of poverty calculations at the state level, and so we had lost last year some com schools that were supposed to be community schools. This year ended up not being community schools. Um, so I, I wanted to, I understand it's a state level issue, but yeah. I wanted to see if that has been resolved since. So we won't have the same issue come up again this year. Yeah, so thank you for asking that question because I know in just a few short months, you'll start to look at um, budget proposals and you'll see our requests come in, um, which will be before we get the list from MSDE of who's eligible for community schools. So we are working on projections using um, the very complex methodology that has been adopted by MSDE to determine eligibility for community schools. So um, we are attempting to use that process to create projections with the understanding that the state has the flexibility to make adjustments to how they um, determine which data points are used, not really data points, but which period of time is used to determine the data points for <clears throat> calculating. So um, it's been resolved as it is. However, um, we can't really check that resolution until we get the next list of schools to see if the methodology stays consistent with what they use this school year. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Unfortunately, because okay you know, the way our timeline works with notifying schools and giving out staffing to schools, like it doesn't align with what MSDE tells us. So, you know, we, we're just making projections and, you know, that that's kind of the, the main issue is that the timelines don't align. Correct. And are we are we communicating this to our schools, to our administrators to so that they know this is a projection and could change, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So let me tell okay. you what our our plan is. Our plan is to after October 31st when we get some preliminary data on um, the number of students who are directly certified or eligible for SNAP, Medicaid, homeless, migrant, or foster care services to use that data in November to determine projections. We then plan to alert principals or schools rather who we believe will be eligible just to give them some insight on what could be coming and then once we get more firm data from msde which last year it wasn't really firm until february we will finalize and report to schools so even though we are not positive we will give a heads up just in case because we're using our own projection method OK, thank you. And also mm -hmm. another question on one of the slides, um, speaking of the higher concentration of poverty um, schools and as that increases, you know, as a blueprint throughout the years um, progresses, um, we're, it, it's speaking of, of the two extra positions in community schools as well as um, the per student funding per, per pupils, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm because that's a part of a, you know some questions that come up in my mind as far as um, equitable allocation of resources. So that's I wanted to clarify that that was what I was seeing on um, a particular slide. 
Yep, that there are two separate grants. One is for personnel, and there's a requirement for how we use personnel grant funding. Any funding remaining after the required staff are identified, schools can use for wraparound supports. And then the per pupil grant funding can also be used for staffing. However, that has to be an outgrowth of the school's needs assessment. If the needs assessment determines additional staffing are needed outside of the required staff, then they may use your, their per pupil grant or even their personal grant to add additional staff. So yes. OK, thank you. And just a quick comment also. Um, I love the um, neighborhood network approach. I think it's amazing. So I liked I'd love to see that in the in your um, slides. That was awesome. So thank you for that. Excellent. I'm glad you're happy with that. <laughs> I just had one question and I'm, I'm sorry if this is a dumb question, but um, so when it comes to community schools and Title One schools, it seems like a lot of the Title One schools are going to be community schools. So is that like a title that gets changed? Do they still are they still have to consider Title One? Does it change any of their, you know, what they're allowed to have? I, I just I, I'm, yeah. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, that's an actually an excellent question, to be honest with you. So both community schools and Title One schools are determined using um, poverty percentages from within the community. The difference in the calculations are based on state and federal guidelines. So Title I funds are determined using federal metrics and federal um, poverty calculations, while community school funds are used using state blueprint um, calculations and methodologies. So there is a difference in how poverty percentages are determined for each group, but then the intent and purpose is also slightly different. The intent and purpose of Title I is to close achievement gaps for students that reside in high poverty communities and provide them with opportunities that their peers may have in more affluent communities. While it's very similar with community schools, community schools focus on connecting wraparound services to academic supports or connecting out of school time programs to in school time activities and, and areas of focus, as well as providing um, some additional supports to the adults that are um, supporting students outside of the school day. So it's almost like Title I takes care of a lot of the during the school day and academic pieces, while community schools is really focused on um, providing this holistic approach that addresses in and out of school needs. And Michelle, just to add to that too, a school can be a Title I school and a community school. A school can be only a Title I school and Correct. a school can be only a community school. So it doesn't replace, one doesn't Correct. replace the other. Correct. That was my question. Thank you. Any um, other questions? May I have a motion to approve the community school system wide evaluation contract? So move, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Stoleski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the motion passes. The next one is aug augmentative and alternative communication devices. And for that, we have Ms. Myers and Ms. Bailey and Ms. Larson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll try to be quick on this one for you. Um, <laughs> so this is um, a contract for augmentative and alternative communication devices. The purpose of this um, contract modification is to provide for the continued purchase of um, augmentative and alternative communication devices required for students um, with identified disabilities. Those devices help to facilitate um, the development and the use of communication skills so that children um, and students can express their wants, needs, and ideas um, clearly. Um, so I'm open to questions or I can go through it further, but did anyone have any questions about this contract? Any questions for Ms. Myers? 
OK, hearing none, I will. Um, is there a motion to approve the contract for the um, alternative communication devices? <laughs> I know that's Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Booker DeWire. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Humphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker DeWire? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next, so motion for the contract passes. Before we go, thank you, Ms. Myers, to the next topic. Um, are any of the rest of the topics contracts, Dr. Donato? So three, three more things. Yes, so the um, secondary um, English language arts, um, that's for an RFI for us to look at a secondary, uh, get information for a secondary curriculum. Um, let's see, the HMH interpreting are um, some updates. And the elementary to middle advanced math sequence is not a contract either, but to share with you some changes in um, content progression through elementary math in order to create additional pathways for students to have access to advanced academic math versus our current pathway, which is you are pretty much identified at grade four. Right. Um, and so some right. changes in that. So. So these three are not ti as time sensitive because they're not coming to the contracts committee. Is that the, accurate? The secondary um, English. Yeah. Okay. Can, yeah. OK, so the second. OK, because it is um, 10 of six and I just want to be um, considerate of the time. Um, for people, yeah. so may I offer one thing very quickly. The two that are time sensitive are the secondary RFI and the math sequence, and only because while they're not contract specific, they do impact our communication to schools and our ability to move forward. So um, that would be helpful for me. We can hold on the update for HMH Elementary. OK, because um, I think Ms. Dominowski and Ms. Pumphrey are going. Oh, never mind, Ms. Dominowski's. Um, I thought she had to leave. So is everybody good to stay for till 6.15? Or we have two back to school night people. OK, I'm just trying to figure out how to do this in the time frame because I think we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, but let's go to so we're going to defer the HMH reading update. That's OK, correct? OK, um, then let's talk. Start the secondary EL RFI and if people need to log off, we'll just hope we still have a quorum to vote on it. Can I just ask one quick question? It's not like um, just about the HMH update. Will it be included in the um, board meeting next week? I don't think was it was a topic. It was it's not a topic. I mean, the, right, unless there's we, going to be some overview information as far as we will provide some general updates on reading. We are focusing on the elementary, so not as in depth as this, um, but there will be updates on the HMH um, implementation. OK, thank you. Um, we can schedule another meeting to, um, instead of waiting for the next month's meeting if board members would like us to schedule one to talk about the HMH reading updates sooner. So you can put that in the chat if you'd like it, but let's move on to the secondary ELRFI because that's time sensitive, correct? Oops. OK, I'm getting refined to schedule meetings. OK. So I'm going to jump in while they're giving you their schedule in the chat if that's OK just in the interest of time. So um, this presentation was to uh, let you know that we are embarking on the process as everyone is very familiar and we've already underscored the need for a strong tier one in our secondary grades. <laughs> um, Comar also requires it, right? We have to have an evidence-based curriculum in ELA and math in um, pre-K through 12. And so we are embarking on the process. We've already had the stakeholder committee. We included lots of data about who participated as outlined in policy and rule 6002. Uh, we would like to move forward with a pilot. Uh, we want the pilot to begin in the second marking period, hence my time sensitive nature, so that I can make sure to provide adequate professional learning um, for the schools selected. So I think that's it in a 30 second nut, uh, nutshell, but I would welcome any questions. Um, this is just the very beginning of that process. Questions? Um, 
so one question is so you've picked you picked one to pilot correct the hmh we did ordinarily we would um pilot more than one but as you saw from the scores there was a pretty significant disparity between the top and the second and so and then there was a very close between second and third so we came to a decision that it would be one or three and three seemed unreasonable to place on schools so our recommendation is that we pilot the one because it was so significantly outperforming in the stakeholder review okay thank you for that any other questions about the secondary ELA curriculum, RFI? You guys have to shorten these titles at some point. <laughs> so I did just, I have one question just around the data that's that we're using. So I, I keep going back to like the assessment data and what are the concepts that students are struggling with and then how is that used to inform mm -hmm. the curriculum to ensure that, um, you know, there, there's areas where our students are doing really well and areas where they, they definitely need more support. And is the curriculum that we're selecting um, addressing those areas? That's just always yep. my question about any time it comes to curriculum selection. Yep, it's, it's a great question and I'm going to be super fast, but of course Dr. Kraft can add. Um, big areas for us historically and currently when we analyze MCAP data in, in secondary, but as well as um, PSAT, SA data, SAT data, and uh, even MISA data and biology, we are stronger with reading literature. So we're looking for a curriculum that does both, but that has an emphasis on reading information across disciplines. We also know that we need to strengthen writing as it pertains to our data across the disciplines. So those two specifically from a standards perspective, um, and the language standards. So the, the language standards are a big part of SAT um, and PSAT and how they're measured. And so um, there's a lot of other factors that go into how we evaluate a curriculum, but specifically around what are the standards that we historically have had more challenge in. Um, those are two areas that were a focus as we evaluated different curricula to choose to align to our data. Um, anything you wanna add, Dr. Kraft? There's others, but those are probably the top three. Top three, and in, in, in interest of time, we can leave them at the top three. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I um, some kind of question, comment in one. Um, it's just was uh, with the pilot. Is there thought of? Because I know I read the comments from teachers saying it was it was difficult, but they're excited to learn about it. And I think that's kind of what's going on with the um, elementary ELA HMH. A lot of teachers are saying it's a lot. Um, and the trainings weren't, some of them weren't going as well as they had liked. And is there a thought of training our teachers while they're piloting? I know it's hard because you don't know if we're actually going to do it or not because it's a pilot, but just to, I don't know, incentivize that in some way so that we have more people yep. than just what HMH offers us as a training session. Yeah, it's a great point, and we always wish we could do it ourselves, but our offices, again, are smaller, so we rely on vendors. Um, we um, we actually already started along those lines in that um, we gave a preview to every secondary teacher on professional study day of the curriculum. So to your point, while we're not going to get too far ahead, uh, we have learned that lesson that the more people that we can have participating in that training, the longer on ramp or runway we can give teachers to learn something. It's part of why we're coming to you now. If we can pilot in the second marking period, then we should be able to come back to this group with a recommendation for adoption in plenty of time to do a tremendous amount of professional learning throughout the spring semester mm -hmm. and summer. Part of the challenge is that when teachers come in in August, that many of them participated in summer training, but there's no, you know, three or six hours that's ever going to make teachers feel completely comfortable when they are welcoming kids three days later. So we are, uh, the secondary and ELA offices are working Secondary and elementary offices work very closely. Ms. Wicks, our coordinator, is here tonight. She literally has followed with a pen of like, okay, what don't I want to do that we learned from elementary to strengthen that? And part of that is early and often training, expanding it to include and trying to build capacity internally. Um, in the feedback, when we had feedback, there was one session teachers um, texted that it wasn't going well. Dr. Kraft was literally in that session within about six minutes. So we know that it goes better when we participate more actively ourselves. So we're trying to, while the office has gotten smaller, build capacity with our partners in schools to do exactly what you're describing. Great, thank you. 
Um, I just yeah. had one question, and I, I did do my homework, but if I, I may have forgotten. So I know that this um, HMH for secondary was is on the list of um, somebody's list that's important. Ed to reports. Be yep. Yeah, Ed reports. But um, are there any, is there any data connected with that as far as other districts that have used it and um, how students performed? Yes, Dr. Kraft, you want to speak to that? And we can certainly send it as a follow up so you have more yes. specifics. So we uh, we did ask um, the company to um, uh, compile uh, data from districts that had been using it two or more years um, with state data. We didn't want any internal data. And so they are putting that together and we will be able to send that out to you shortly um, because we always know it's important. And we also want to make sure that we're using a state test or an external test outside of their test to say, like, are you seeing student growth over time? Um, I saw a quick preview of it and um, it looked really good and I'm excited to be able to share it. So as soon as uh, the vendor gets it to me, we will. Uh, I'll get it to Ms. Shea and uh, Dr. Dinanato to get out to you all. Okay, thank you. And then, I last time when, and when you piloted the elementary with the one, and then we added the other one several months later. Are you concerned at all about that repeating itself with the secondary? So we talked about, so in, in full transparency, we had a meeting for just that. Do we want to go down this path of one and then adding a two because that almost killed us, right? <laughs> we, we don't want to do that. So um, that was exactly why we actually had a pre-conversation and, and wanted to have the conversation today to show you the data about the difference between the top score and the second two. Um, to be honest, it is a lot to put on teachers and real life children just to prove a point, right? So, so yes, I have that, but I think there's more to it than just that. I think we have some structures in place, like I said, previewing with every teacher on professional study day, involving teachers early and more often um, to uh, allow us to, to to be more proactive in our support that I don't anticipate the same. I do think we live in an era where sometimes social media makes things more challenging because teachers who don't have the same access. So part of our strategy of showing teachers first was to allow them to have that opportunity to experience it themselves um, to engage in that. So it was a question when, I mean, I think Dr. Nod Donato was on her second day and I was like, here's my challenge. I don't really want to go down one and come back, but this is what the data are telling. And I don't want to put the burden on schools and teachers if I don't think something that had that score that was significantly less, it does not feel like that's a value add um, for schools at this point. One of the challenges also was truly the second and third were so close together. It would be very difficult to justify doing the second without doing the third because their scores were so similar and so you really are doing one or three and we have a much smaller number of schools when we're talking right in elementary school you can spread it out and right. um so it would be a burden on nearly every school if we really tried to do it with enough statistical significance for comparison so that was all part of our conversation i just wanted to bring that up just um because it was yeah yeah right but I do think the proactive things, showing that many teachers ahead of time, I don't remember us ever doing something like that before. So I think you're right, um, more proactive and more eyes on it um, ahead of time, I think can only you know enhance the pilot. So thank you. Any other questions? May, so what am I, I may, may I have a motion to go forward with the secondary ELA curriculum RFI? So move. So okay. second. Okay. Um, Miss Cox, a roll call. A roll call vote, please. Miss Lifton. Yes. Miss Pumphrey. Yes. Miss Booker Dwyer. Yes. Miss Dominowski. Yes. Miss Stolowski. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to thank Miss Wicks for being here. She's amazing and you'll all get to meet her. I'm sorry in the interest of expediency, we just railroaded right on over, but you'll hear from her lots as we move through this process. And I want to thank her. Um, she's a fantastic leader for secondary and will be really helpful in making this work for our schools. Thank, thank you. you. And um, Dr. DiDonato and I will will look with a critical eye at agenda planning, knowing <laughs> the knowing the expertise now that is present from the board and the questions that are going to be asked. So we will kind of 
narrow the scope of the agenda and have additional meetings if we needed. So I'm going to skip the HMH. I will work with Ms. Gover to plan another meeting um, and then move to the, but we should do the math sequence tonight, right? Correct. Okay, math sequence. And for that one, we have a whole bunch of people. So everybody come on and let's go. <laughs> Everyone gets 12 seconds to speak. So as uh, Mr. Corns is flipping through, um, I'm going to uh, welcome Kisalia Mshinda as our Director of Mathematics. I know we're joined, uh, Mr. Corns could not be with us, but um, the lovely and talented Ms. Robin Holly Briante is here from the Office of Advanced Academics. And of course, I'm joined by my colleague, um, Dr. Wisted. This is a collaborative partnership. We shared the recorded presentation that had a significant amount of information for you. Um, but the big idea here here is twofold. Um, one is that we do want to have opportunity and access for multiple entry points for students to have the opportunity to enter into a pathway for advanced mathematics at multiple points in their elementary, middle, and even high school career. Um, previous pathways made it much more challenging for students to do that. A second piece that we want to address is that um, the sequence that we have currently does require students to skip. And so when you look at our math data, we are not showing that that is serving our students well at any level, even in some of our advanced academics courses. And so what we know is that by design, even for our students who are advanced, we're creating gaps in the curriculum. So part of the shifts in this sequence with some of those accelerated courses and our new evidence-based curriculum in illustrative math allows us to address both, to have an opportunity to ensure that students have um, access to instruction in all of the standards in a truly compacted and accelerated model, which is a uh, research-based supported approach to advanced academics, um, while also allowing for multiple entry points for students that as they developmentally enter, they may not be yet ready at the elementary level, but we have multiple opportunities for them to get on that pathway. Um, team, anything you want to advance into the context? Because I know they got to see your much more detailed recorded presentation, and then we can go right to questions unless you have anything you want to add that I forgot. All right, they're nodding at me and smiling, so I'm, I must have did. Uh, OK, so um, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Lichter, for questions. I do have one question to start, and that is the idea of giving the um, test to our second graders um, at that's such a young age. And I, got, I have my own feelings about that, but can you give me some somebody kind of talk through that to make me feel better? Yes, yeah, so the good news is it's coming together with this opportunity that it's not a one and done, right? So we are, and actually Coma requires us to begin providing these pathways mm -hmm. early and often for differentiation. So actually this is a national movement with the state. And so what might alleviate your fears is it's not the only time. We're not making so a decision at age seven that this is it for you. We're mm -hmm. just beginning the process so that if there are students that early that are already showing that opportunity for a need for something different, Different, we're poised to do it, um, but that goes together with our efforts to have multiple entry points and screening. So there's another universal screening that happens at that transition opportunity after elementary school, as well as multiple opportunities for diagnostics throughout the middle and high school courses to constantly be looking for students who might be in need of further um, advancement. OK, as long as there's more on ramps in the past, we haven't had that many on ramps, and then I felt like we were excluding students who may blossom Right. a little bit later than their peers. So as long as that there are on ramps and there's ways to get kids up to speed who are showing that they would benefit from that pathway. OK, we were just talking about 40 students that blossomed in the summer before ninth grade, right? Miss Machinda, we were just discussing that at one school, 40 students that that made a change. So we're definitely okay. looking at multiple pathways. OK, thank you. Any other questions about the advanced mathematics sequence? I have a question. I have a few questions. On slide five, the proposed sequence, and, and you know, while they're getting to that slide, I love the fact that you all did this analysis and saw the gaps and was able to address it. Um, and so I just I absolutely love that. I share uh, the, the chair's concerns with testing kids so early. Um, can we go back one slide where we see the, the big matrix? So if a student, if you all, I, could you just explain this to me? So how, explain the points of when students will be tested and when are potential entry points for students who 
um, demonstrate, you know, if they are currently in math five, um, how, what would be the process for them to say, okay, you can now go to math seven B eight, set late seven, yeah, seven B eight. So the sequence shows the, the spread of um, approximately six years and four, and that's really the whole compacting. So starting with grade three all the way to grade eight, they're accomplishing all of that. If I'm a student in, let them take me back to your example, in grade five. In grade five, and I'm doing really well, I couldn't have a pathway to go to this, you know, math, six, seven, A, or to seven B. If I was in grade five, I would have to just go to math six, even if I'm experienced demonstrating, um, you know, all of our students are gifted. So I don't want to say they're demonstrating giftedness or whatever, but they are performing at a higher level. They would still have to go into math grade six and they wouldn't get an opportunity to go on the accelerated track until grade seven. No, that so if the the top two rows show both students in grade five, um, so there's grade five math in that top row, that student would go and begin the accelerated process in middle grades based on the data, um, and we have students doing that this year. If I'm in grade five and it looks like the progression and my my time in grade five, I need that time to be in depth, and I go to grade six. So in grade five, that is another another you know data point that would allow a student to enter the accelerated pathway. And in grade six, I can begin six, seven, eight. So now I'm beginning to do that compactedness. I will have an opportunity to get to algebra one in grade eight. Okay, now if I'm in mathematics four, okay. I won't be able to move up to mathematics six, seven. And so once, I'm that, once I've been identified at grade two, that I'm on the accelerated pathway, then I'm on that pathway, and if I'm identified at grade four, I won't get an opportunity to, or am I even, do I get an opportunity to be identified at grade four? What are the options for me? I'm, I'm going to start and then invite Ms. Machinda. So really the, the, the goal is that the formal screening may not happen at the end of grade four for all fourth graders. We don't want to universally screen all kids every year, but any student who's demonstrating that acceleration, we would do you know, in response to that. The current pathway, we don't want to also create gaps. So advanced five students are in a grade six, seven A. If I'm in fourth grade, there's also opportunity for enrichment extension built into that curriculum. That would be an opportunity where we have those tasks built into the fourth grade curriculum that allow students to experience those grade five standards. Then we would be able to know we would we would not, I'm not going to say never because we know that there are students that can, but we would not by program want to take students from grade four to grade six, seven A because we'd be by design creating a gap in grade five. They wouldn't have those standards. Instead, we would use some of the more uh, curricular based opportunities for students to demonstrate that. So if you're doing very well in, in fourth grade math, we're going to give you those enrichment tasks that are taking those standards up through the fifth grade level, and we're going to use that as a body of evidence. At the end of that fifth grade year, that's when there's a curricular pathway that allows for that formal acceleration. Now we are also, and you see this more reflected in the pink lines at middle school, um, we've been investigating and starting with summer opportunities where students have an opportunity. A lot of times we think about summer programming as just for remediation, but this is an opportunity where we have had some schools mostly at that um, middle school and high school level, but certainly an option for elementary would be to offer that acceleration opportunity in the summer for that same student. We just don't want to, by design, create a hole in those standards because what we're finding in some of our data is that it's creating gaps for students. So in this revised model, then either you're identified at grade second or grade five to second, third, five, and then really six, seven, eight and nine. <laughs> Really, it's just that fourth to fifth that's a little bit difficult because like this year, we're going to be universally screening second and third graders to be able to make, to make that adjustment. And so there's actually really fourth to fifth is the only one that there's not. You can see with the yellow arrows and then the pink arrows where we've I designated those um, entry points. Um, it's really only the fourth to fifth where there's not a current one identified, but that's where there would be opportunities for those enrichment tasks or summer programming options. 
And, and then I just have other questions just around like the demographics of the students who are currently on the advanced pathway and then how do we what the I, I know you said it's going to expand opportunities, but but what is the predicted or what is, the, is their target for what you know for those for the students who will be identified and then how are parents notified like I, this is what I find is, is often a, a common thing. A lot of times parents they don't know. And so I just I still just have a lot of questions about this before I'm like totally on board with um with the revised pathway. I see where we're going, but I don't know if it's crystal clear to me just yet. I, I don't know if it's just the graphic and how I, I don't know what it is, but it's like I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. And I would I would love to know like who who are the what's the demographic of students that are currently on the advanced pathway? How will this modified approach help to improve um, that access like I saw the made questions at the back and that was great it I would love to know the the answers to those made questions um, so let me interrupt for a second um, Ms. Yeah. Burke. so I, I understand that you're not ready to um, vote on it we're going to lose quorum in a minute I can't remember what the implications of not voting on this part tonight are Miss Shea or yeah, so and, and I will defer to Doc. I don't know that this is necessarily a vote because it isn't a contract piece specifically. What we didn't want to do was to begin working with schools having never had an opportunity to have the discussion with board. So I, I, I don't even know that. And I'll defer to you, Dr. DiDonato, but um, I think this was more an opportunity for us to share with the board okay. and receive your questions because and the timeliness for me was less about a vote and more about I need to be working with teachers and I didn't want to do that without offering okay. the opportunity for board members. Okay, right. So, Ms. To be able to, oh, so sorry, Ms. Solosky, you can go to back to school night and the rest of us can stay on just to thank do the you questions. for going to back to school night. Yes, yeah, so just to do no, no worries, just to do the questions and answers. So back to Ms. Booker Dwyer. Um, so I didn't. I'm sorry. I had to interrupt. I was just trying to let her go. So go. <laughs> so like, what? And you may not have the answers now. At some point, whenever this comes back around um, for an official vote, to, you know, just to have those uh, answers as far as the current demographics of students who are currently in the advanced program at you know different uh, entry points. Um, the, these answers to the questions that are posed on um, slide 13, those made questions. And then just what is a communication strategy for parents so that they can advocate for their child or prepare their child since now it's so early. I mean, at grade two, you're not even really thinking about that. Um, and so how can, what is the communication strategy for parents so that they can prepare their child and proactively advocate for their child? Mm -hmm. So um, I can respond that as far as the demographic information, um, you're very timely because just last night, uh, Wade Kearns presented to the GTCAC the annual report that goes to the board. So this may or may not have been, I don't know when you received the annual report. It's my understanding you received it sometime in June. Um, so there's policy and rule that says an annual report must be presented to the board with certain information um, on demographics and um, you know attendance measures, suspension measures, things like that. And so Mr. Kearns has summarized that into a slideshow that he shared with the GTCAC last night, assuming that you all um, had received the report a few months ago. Uh, so that's an idea that maybe we could come back to curriculum committee and he can potentially uh, share a similar, you know, slideshow or and, and then you can ask questions about the report and things like that as an idea that maybe can like ground the like the basics of what gets annually reported to the board. So that's for consideration for whoever does the next um, agenda planning. planning for the next committee. <laughs> Okay. I, I um, think if I can add to some of the other questions, some of what you asked is about the referral and review process. So I know that um, Robin might also want to, and I know certainly um, Melissa, you can as well. In terms of communication for parents, there's a significant sure. effort to communicate to parents about the universal screening process and what those opportunities are. Um, we also have, um, so so I'll let Robin share a little bit about that, which talks about your communication for, for teachers, um, for students. Part of why this is so timely 
importantly for me is because we do want to use this for professional study day with teachers and with principals so that they can continue to advocate and communicate with families too. Part of our opening up access is about these multiple pathways. Students who get to the middle school grades and begin to blossom and then it's too late for them. You didn't take, we know that algebra tends to be a gatekeeper um, and we're trying to create readiness for all students to be successful through that curricular design. In terms of your question about racial breakdown, as uh, Dr. Wisted shares those statistics, when you asked about the goal, typically with any product or program or initiative, you're looking for it to reflect your student population and the same ratios that you see overall as a system. What I will offer to you is while we do see, uh, we still continue to see some disparities racially, we actually over identify compared to national models of identification. And you kind of meant uh, yourself, Ms. Booker Dwyer said everybody's gifted. <laughs> so some of our data does sort of show that to some degree we sometimes think that in some of our communities. And part of what we're trying to do is there's also a difference in the elementary grades between being early and being advanced, right? So some of our students present as advanced in those primary grades, but really they're just early. They've had maybe some access or opportunity, but they get to a point where actually the grade level curriculum is sufficiently challenging for them. This also gives an opportunity for a both and that students aren't then stuck in a pathway where there isn't an opportunity without feeling or experiencing failure to think that they can be completely challenged in an on grade level coursework. Um, and then the last piece, Ella, because you asked like three or four questions at once. I do think that, well, these are entry points into much larger conversations, right? So we had a similar conversation internally when we were talking about these efforts. Our goal was, as I said in the beginning, sort of twofold. Opening the access is to have multiple entry points and be responsive to students' developmental needs and being able to not create barriers to access to mathematics. The second option was to make sure that by choosing to be an advanced pathway, we're not saying you have to skip an entire grade level of standards and then by design create gaps that then later would somehow again make you experience that math failure, which was really a curricular failure by design. So those were our two goals system line. I think you ask a lot of questions about the referral and review and just GT in general, which I agree with Dr. Wistet. We can certainly do probably by now we're booking March with all the things we've come <laughs> up with today for the agenda planning, but I think I think it's a great opportunity and I think these presentations are intended to open that dialogue for us to share some of those pieces. But I want it to be really clear because I've got some professional development days coming up that I want to meet with these advanced five teachers because if we don't get them poised, then we can have all the pathways in the world. The kids won't will have to keep waiting and kids will miss that track. So that's really our sense of urgency tonight. But I think it can be an ongoing conversation uh, around some of the other points you brought up. Would you like me to quickly share the ways in which we communicate with parents at that initial universal screening? The um, there are three times during that in, that initial process where we communicate with parents. The first time is when we are sending home a letter, letting them know that their student is their child is going to be taking the COGAT, the cognitive achieve the cog the cognitive ability test. So they are informed that that's coming up. Um, that's a letter sent home to parents. The second time is parents are given a survey to fill out sharing their students' strengths in math as well as ELA. And then the third time parents uh, receive communication is they receive a letter uh, by June 1st from the school that communicates if students have been identified for either ELA or math at the third grade level and then fifth grade, it's all four core subject areas. And at that point, um, the letter includes information on how to appeal that decision. So I hope that's helpful. It's helpful. I wonder how if it's being implemented with fidelity at the school level. Mm. Uh, that is my I think that is my biggest concern. I, I think that process that you've laid out that is ideal and that's great. I'm, I'm wondering if we go to some elementary schools and some middle schools and actually talk to parents, will they say that was what they've experienced? Um, so that's my only concern with that. And so especially as we're changing this, just really ensuring that that fidelity at the school level and that communication is truly happening. Um, because I don't know if it's consistent throughout Baltimore County. And I just know in my own experience, that's never happened. Um, I've always had to advocate to to make it happen. So I'm just, I, that is my concern. Thank you for sharing. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we didn't have to vote on that, but 
Um, we do have a lot of follow ups. So I got my list is is growing. Um, so Dr. DiDonato and I will get together very soon to plan another agenda. I will have Ms. Gover um, help us find a date that would work for board members and for staff um, to come back, especially about the HMH update um, and some of these other topics. But I, I do want to thank the board members that are still on for being able to stay on, for doing the homework and the pre-work. If we hadn't even done the pre-work, we would be here for a whole lot longer. And I want to thank staff for putting together those PowerPoints. They really were informative and for answering um, so many of our questions. Um, but I think they were really good questions and really are help us move this work forward. So let me look at my script. Um, last item on the agenda is the announcement, but the next scheduled committee meeting was going to be on October 5th, which it still will be, and I will get back in touch as far as when we can do another meeting um, to kind of um, get caught up. Um, is there any further business at this point? OK, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. And again, thank you everybody for joining us and your participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.